since the 1980s. He has been involved in, in, in observation on Olympic arising at the national level in Latin America. He was covering the, the Nicaragua Revolution. He has been attending as international observer the, the past, I believe, at least six presidential elections in Mexico. And Adelita San Vicente Tello, he, he is a little older than he seems. Adelita San Vicente Tello, and, and they are my friends, Ted Luis is my friend. Actually, we work together. I am part of Global Exchange, that is, he's one of the, the funders. And Adelita San Vicente Tello is the, the executive director of, of Semillas, Semillas de Vida, and also one of the leaders in Maiz Noy Kai Paiz. Without border is no country that is a very large country in Mexico, grand in the US, and undocumented immigrant and illegal alien, and I am happy. <laughs> I don't care. And, the, and I have been living here for many years, and, and I feel that I, in some way I have an effect of yeah. social neoliberalism, you know, in capitalism, because Mexico is, is one of the main laboratories for this, and, and worldwide. And well, I, I would like to start talking about the, the history of Mexico. No? And the way I see it, I think that Mexico has had in the past 500 years so many transformations, starting for the, the, the revolution against the Aztec Empire in, in the central Mexico, that was not the conquest of, of Spaniards coming to, to America and conquering Mexico was a, a revolt against the dominant power in that time that was the Aztec Empire. You know, and, and for that that was important not only the, the, that gave the power to Europe to came and were in the right moment to establish something different and, and they used the cosmovision of Aztec to do that. So three hundred years after we have the the revolt of Spaniards that were the los criollos, los españoles criollos the Romans in, in Mexico, and they revolt against the peninsular Spaniards who have all the control of the, the, the Mexican, the, the New Spain politics. And then in that moment, I feel, I believe that the, the children of these Spaniards from Spain that were born in Mexico, they took over the, the power. In 1910, we have the Mexican Revolution, that was for land and freedom, and actually it was where rich people who ended up also taking some of the main positions. And, and for many years, the, the PRI, the, the PRI, Partido Revolucionario Institucional, Institucional Revolucionary Party, Party, they were in power over 70 years until 2000. But before that, in 1998, we have an electoral fraud against Cuauhtémo Cárdenas. In 1988, and everything was planned by, by the international, este, the the World Bank and the international fund, monetary fund, the, the consensus of Washington. They planned this electoral fraud in 1998 in order to 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 bring all the neoliberal receipts to Mexico and to make them work. And what happened is Salinas de Gortari is one of the, the biggest rovers in history. He took everything, he has been like the power behind the power for many years. And in 2000, we have the, uh, a transition from the, this party. In, well, I, I have to say that in 1998, the, the guy who was running was from the left, or supposedly was from the left, was the son of Lázaro Cárdenas del Río, who is called the best Mexican president after the Mexican Revolution. And then in, in 2000, we have an election in which there was a transition into democracy, supposedly, but they put a guy who used to be the president of a soda company like Coca-Cola or Pepsi, and, and actually he, he did a very bad job. In 2006, there was another electoral fraud that I think that this maybe is going to talk about it, and Manuel López Obrador este, lost the election, but there was an electoral fraud. In 2012, they invest a lot of money, but by then, already we have the war on drugs that have there so far like 200,000 people 
killed you know, in Mexico. Actually, from the five major world conflicts in the world, that is Syria, Niger, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Mexico, Mexico is the closest. It's not Syria, it's not Afghanistan, it's not it's Mexico. But the US media don't talk about it. So, and all the weapons are coming from the US, and the money also is coming from here because it's about drugs. And so, and, and then. So, so now we, we have finally, after three attempts, you know, Mitterrand in different places like Lula in Brazil, Mitterrand in France, and they, they have, they have got to three times to, to try to become presidents of their countries, and López Obrador in the third attempt he is becoming the president of Mexico. And López Obrador has a very interesting story because he, he's, he's like somebody who has been visiting the whole country, the poorest town, and he has a lot of support. He's very charismatic. And, and now there are a lot of contradictions that we see that we're going to talk about maybe. And, and I am very hopeful that this is going to change a lot of things. The first thing that I see that are, for me, are very good is that he's implementing a agroforestry program of 1 million hectares to 1.1 million acres to hire 400,000 people permanently. Where is so where is it? It's going to be the whole country in, in areas that are not used for anything. And then there is another that is his body fracking. You know, things that we have been fighting in California for years on the U.S., he's going just to make them simple, you know. It doesn't work for the people, we don't need them. We're going to ban fracking, we're going to implement agroforestry. We're, he, one of the things that he says that I think that is really good is to say we're going to create this agroforestry project because this is going to bring more jobs than any Chrysler, any Monsanto, any of these big corporations. And how many jobs was it? I'm sorry? How many jobs did you build? 400,000. 400. In 2.4 million acres. So I, I'm going to give the word to. Thank you very much, Miguel. Yeah, um, thanks for everyone for coming out to hear about Mexico. As Miguel said, I work with Global Exchange. I've been uh, working at Global Exchange uh, around the issues of Mexico for a lot of years now, um, since 1994, when the uh, when I came out after to to help observe the elections that were happening. That we've investigated a lot of different areas uh, of of life and struggle in Mexico. Um, the, you know, folks certainly remember Chiapas. We uh, had volunteers down there and did a lot of work. What's that? Would you like to see it? Yeah. Um, uh, we, we worked with the democratic unions in Mexico, particularly the teachers union. Uh, we have observed electoral conditions and have, have gotten deeply involved with the civic and, and uh, um, uh, Human rights movements in Mexico are doing observation around the country. We worked in, around the idea of immigration reform. We published this book 10 years ago, The Right to Stay Home, just after Lopez Obrador was defrauded of victory in 2006. And this is now the, a slogan of the current government. How well we'll be able to do this is, you know, it remains to be seen. And that's, we'll get into that in a minute. And also, and I think this is very important, um, you know, we have looked into what the military is doing in Mexico. This is a, this is a, a tone that we published in 2000 uh, when Vicente Fox came into power. We were trying to push for reforms in the military. Three generals joined us in writing this book, um, and it made quite an impact. But the recommendation in this book is always near, always far, the armed forces in Mexico. If you, if you want a copy of it, see me. They're really not available in your bookstore anymore. Um, so if they look at that. But what I wanted to, what I wanted to uh, bring out because of the uh, topic of this conference is something that we did back in 1996 after a visit to Tabasco, which is on the Gulf Coast of Mexico. It's a state where the, the petroleum boom of the 1970s you know, had a tremendous impact um, and uh, the uh, social movements in that state started to push back. And I'm, I'm picking this for two reasons. One, it's the theme of this conference, but also it's, it's the place where we met Lopez Obrador, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who's now the president-elect of Mexico. At that time, he was uh, well-known in his home state of Tabasco, um, but he was not 
being, uh, con you know, given the kind of consideration that he should be. And in this, in this case, we went down uh, to uh, see the folks who were in relation, I'll just read a, a, a little portion, in relation to the oil industry, an important recent action of the civic movement that Lopez Obrero was part of. In 1996, coordinate, coordinated citizens to blockade Pemex facilities, that's the National Oil Company, in several indigenous Chontao communities, including Nakahuka at the entrance of Tabasco's most productive oil fields, Campo Sen. In February, a bridge, and this is February of 1996, a bridge leading to the Campo Sen was blocked by citizens who demanded that no more oil wells be drilled in Tabasco until our claims and demands are resolved. Their demands included compensation for campesinos and fishermen whose lands and livelihoods have been severely affected and destroyed by the oil installations. Now that all sounds very familiar to us, doesn't it? It sounds like exactly like the kind of struggles you're going on now. But who was involved in that and who uh, got, got beaten up? Well, let me just read a tiny bit more. Um, the government responded with force. Video images show federal army troops cooperating with local public security in open violation of Article 29 and 129 of the Mexican Constitution, that's the Human Rights Department coming in, which prohibit the participation of armed forces in situations in which the resolution falls within the jurisdiction of civil authorities. More than 30 state and federal police vehicles were at the scene, along with three helicopters from the Attorney General's office. Three army trucks also participated in carrying away detainees. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, a leader in the Tabasco resistance movement, was struck in the head by a police baton and injured. And it goes on to talk about you know, what, what happened there. So I think the important part of why I wanted to bring this up is that Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador is somebody who's been an ally of our movements in the field. Now, 22 years later, uh, he's president of Mexico. He will become president of Mexico. It opens a tremendous um, opportunity for the country. But in those 22 years, since you know, since we wrote this report, and he gained national prominence in Mexico and began, began he started to become the national figure that he now is. The people who helped me with this report told me they said, "Look at this guy. Someday he's going to be president of Mexico because he's a very impressive, very charismatic." intelligent man who really understands and listens to people. What can he do now that, that he's coming in as president? We see, you know, in these in these years that Mexico has, has as Miguel pointed out, uh, descended into a kind of chaos, particularly in the north of the country, where the, the drug war and the kind of metastasized criminality that's come out of that has, um, has captured um, political entities that has captured security forces, local police, state police, uh, even federal police units of the, of the uh, Mexican Navy are involved in horrendous human rights crimes. And this is all happening within the last few months and in the context of these recent elections. Um, we, that is Global Exchange and a lot of other um, uh, organizations from around the world and around Latin America observed the recent elections in Mexico they were an extraordinary experience. And so for me, and you know, because I, I, I've got a lot more I can say, but the, the, the thing of, and the revolution part that's the headline of this panel is that Mexico just committed electoral revolution. They defeated the, what had been the ruling party, the PRI that, that had ruled Mexico for 90 years didn't win in a single electoral district in the entire country. They, they, they did not have the, the majority in a single electoral district. 13.5% of the vote at the national level. They were just erased from the map electorally. So it opens the door to a tremendous uh, you know, reconception of what should happen with Mexico. At the moment, this is something that you know, I think is very important. The, the transition team for the new government has called for there to be foros de paz around the country so that they can go out and listen to people's concern, people from the movement of the disappeared, the families who've had, you know, who've lost uh, family members, um, from people who are dealing, you know, at the root with immigration issues, you know, and, and trying to make Mexico's immigration policies actually be something that could be a model rather than a shame, which is what they are now. Um, and and to, to really, you know, engage with those issues. So they're going out and listening and trying to understand. But the challenges, you know, are, are tremendously uh, deep. How you can, you know, make an economy move forward, uh, not break with the international institutions that have you safeguarded. Right now, NAFTA, we're going to talk, there's another panel tomorrow where we talk about this. NAFTA is being 
renegotiated without the real participation of the new government, um, and they're going to be they're going to come into office with you know some kind of likely new NAFTA deal on the table. So there's all kinds of tremendous challenges on the ecologic front. You know they are they are um, super high. I'm going to turn the baton over. Thank you very much. Um, well, I will be speaking in Spanish. And uh, you. Te, te ayudo? Sí. Okay. Okay. Este me ayudará sí. a, a traducir. Eh, I will help her como, como decía él, la, la mesa se llama La Revolución que viene, ¿no? The, 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 our panel is the revolution that's coming. Y yo me pregunto, lo pongo entre paréntesis, si esto es realmente una revolución. I put in parentheses, is this really a revolution? Eh, porque, como decía Miguel, México vivió una revolución en 1910. As, my, as Miguel said, uh, Mexico had a revolution in 1910. Eh, de esa época murieron entre, eh, la cifra oscila entre un billón y dos billones de personas. During that time, uh, figure somewhere between one and two million people died. Y entre las muchas cosas que ganamos con esa revolución y que aún gozamos. And among the many things that we uh, conquered in that, in that revolution that we still enjoy. Puedo enumerar eh, la educación gratuita. Free education. Salud gratuita. Free health care. Y sobre todo el, el reparto agrario. And, and above all, the land distribution. El 55% del territorio en México es propiedad social. 55% of land in Mexico is social property. Ejidos y comunidades indígenas. And those are called ejidos and, and indigenous communities. Ejidos is a collective form of land. Holding. No hay otro país en el mundo, ni Cuba ni los países socialistas, con esta distribución social de la tierra. And there's not a single country in the world, including Cuba and uh, other supposedly socialist countries, with that kind of land distribution. Y es el producto de una revolución. And that's the product of a revolution. Es una revolución. This is a revolution. Eh, la, re la reforma electoral, lo que tú llamas una revolución electoral. The, the, electoral, the, the electoral reform, what I call the uh, electoral revolution. <laughs> De, de los años 50 y 68 se, se, en los años 50 hubo movimientos muy fuertes de maestros y después en 68 en los ferrocarrileros y 68 el movimiento estudiantil so this movement, this, this uh, revolution comes from the movements of the 50s the, the, the teachers and the railroad workers and in 1968 the well known student movement es un largo proceso también It's a long process. Entonces, hoy estamos en un proceso. Today we're in a process. Es, es un proceso en que logramos que una figura como Andrés Manuel llegara a la presidencia. This is a, a process in which we have achieved that, that a figure like Andrés Manuel López Obrador has arrived to be the president. Pero esto ha sido a partir de, la, de un acuerdo entre muchas fuerzas. But this has come about as, as become, because of an agreement among many forces. Eh, muchos, muchas estamos muy preocupados. Many of us are very concerned. De las alianzas con la gran burguesía mexicana. Because of the alliances that have made, been made with the, the, the bourgeoisie, the rich in Mexico. Y en especial en el tema que hoy nos ocupa. And particularly in the theme that today we're talking about. El sistema agroalimentar. The system of, of uh, food production. Es muy singular. It's very singular. Eh, que el empresario que lo ha acompañado en estos meses. That the, the uh, it, it, it should be noted that there's a, uh, a business <laughs> who's been accompanying López Obrador throughout this process in this Alfonso, Alfonso Romo. Alfonso Romo. Eh, a, este hombre en los años 90 había logrado monopolizar eh, las empresas de semillas. This is the guy who had monopolized the seed, seed industry in the 90s. Y 
no, en todo el mundo. Not just in Mexico, all around the world. Es, se dice que llegó a monopolizar eh, el 25% de las semillas del mundo. It said that he, he has been involved in monopolizing 25% of the world's seeds. Y lo vendió a Monsanto. And he sold it to Monsanto. Oh, oh. fire him. <laughs> eh, y él uh, uh, ha puesto en el Ministerio de Agricultura and the person put into as the head of the uh, agricultural ministry es una persona proclive a favor de los transgénicos is someone who is, is inclined toward transgenics y si bien Andrés Manuel López Obrador ha dicho que no va a haber transgénicos en México and even though López Obrador himself has said there won't be transgénicos or transgenics in Mexico todos sabemos que los transgénicos es parte de un modelo mayor. All of us know that, that, this, that these belong to, the transgenetic products belong to a bigger model. ¿No? Eh, y que implica herbicidas, plaguicidas. Herbicides, uh, pesticides. Y sobre todo, México se ha convertido en un gran país agroexportador. And Mexico, above all, Mexico has become an, a, an agricultural export country. Exportamos a Estados Unidos, aguacate, eh, berries, cerveza, tequila, y muchas otras. Don't need to translate that. Okay, don't, don't need to translate on that one, right? We need to export to the United States uh, avocados, uh, uh, berries, uh, and lots of drugs. Cerveza, tequila, and lots of drugs. Y And people. Entonces, este es un problema mayúsculo. So this is this is a, a capital letters problem. Realmente importamos casi más de la mitad de lo que comemos. We import uh, almost half of what we eat. Eh, maíz, arroz, frijol, trigo. Uh, corn, rice, uh, beans, uh, wheat. Y la pequeña agricultura campesina And the small producer, the peasant, que conserva nuestro maíz that keeps our corn, the genetics, the corn, the, la biodiversidad, the biodiversity, uh, el agua, los bosques, water, the forest, produce 40% de lo que comemos. Produce 40% of what we eat. Y el gobierno lo ha destinado a que migre a Estados Unidos. And the, the government has uh, caused them to migrate to the United States. México necesita una política decidida de apoyo a la pequeña agricultura campesina. Mexico needs a, a program that is dedicated to supporting the small farmers. En ese momento vamos a creer lo que And so in this moment we're going to believe, in this part we're going to believe in López Obrador. Y, y para acabar quiero decir que justo en Tabasco, I'm going to say to finish, in Tabasco, the state of Tabasco, don, fue donde Glisman, was where Glisman, un prestigiado profesor de California, a, 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 a renowned California professor, estudió la milpa, la milpa, la, el uh, sistema de la milpa. Study the, the milpa system, the mini, the, the way different plants are trained to get systems. Yeah. 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 And this system. Y en algún y en alguna medida lo podremos ir con René. And, and in, in uh, a certain way we can, we can have this discussion. Uh, con el pie, la agroecología, el concepto de la agroecología como sistema nació ahí. Yeah. Entonces. And the, the, the idea of, of uh, Agroecology was born there. Entonces, eh, necesitamos ver un cambio radical en la política y sobre todo en esta política tan importante como es la agroalimentaria. So we need a profound change in politics, particularly in this very important uh, food production agroecology. Porque creo que tenemos que entender que finalmente esta es una lucha de clases. So we have to understand finally that this is a, a, a struggle between classes, Una lucha contra el gran capital, a, a struggle against big capital, que se ha apropiado de nuestra alimentación. that has taken over our food supply.
Bueno, pues tal vez podemos hablar, abrir un poco esa discusión y después unas preguntas y después. Me voy a hablar de la discusión de Monjas por un few minutes and then questions and answers. And well, what, what comes to my mind when, when I when she talks about it is that one of the main things that we saw why López Obrador won over the other candidates is that he was talking against este, global, against globalization and against neoliberalism. And one of the things that he was defending was food sovereignty. That is the, what Mexico needs to, to become again este, self-sufficient in food production, right? And that is one of the main goals. And one of the goals that he has is, one of the main goals is to have is enough food production to, to satisfy the, the internet demand, but also to guarantee prices to farmers because many times now the fluctuation of prices goes up and down and when they are producing the food when they try to sell it it's a lot cheaper so they lost any profit so he said that that's going to change and it's the same that he's doing with for example with pharmaceuticals we have supposedly free health care now he says that we don't need any kind of insurance or anything to have free access to universal free care after January, and also that he's going to create the national laboratories to, to, to create the medicines that we need to have enough este, medicines because now sometimes there are no medicines in some places. So he says gonna, the production is going to be national, and that is very important that kind of nationalism. And, and I believe that it's going to be a crazy process because there are so many interests. And one of the main problems with Lopez Obrador for the past. 12, 15 years was the the rich people, the wealth in, in Mexico, you know? and he had to 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 create an alliance in the, in the past election with somebody who was representing these people, and the, the guy who was more sensitive about about it was Alfonso Romo, who is the millionaire who who is now the one of the main people in the team of este, López Obrador, but that was something very political, I believe. If he had done that, and other rich people would have seen that he was working with these people, they would, it would, it would be very hard, you know? But Mexico is a big one. his chief of staff, so he has his ear, so it's, it's a problem. Yes, no, I, I totally agree, but there is something that, that López Obrador has been accused, has been, Always they said, no, President Obrador, don't listen to anyone. He is so stubborn. He just got his eyes. And that is really good. He can have a chief of staff, but he's not going to listen to him. He doesn't want to be one. And that is good. Okay. No, wait. Now I was talking with Ignacio Chapela from Berkeley. We have a phone call. And we've been talking about this. And he said, I am concerned about this, this, this. But actually now, Ignacio Chapela and Adelita San Vicente Tello, they went to, you know Ignacio Chapela, yes. who discovered the cross-pollination of Guillermo Moro in Oaxaca. He went to, with Adelita San Vicente to secondary school, or high school? No. Why is he? They were the same, they were teenagers, but also Maria Elena Alvarez Muller. Maria Elena Alvarez Muller won this year the national, uh, the, the, the national prize of science and technology, and she's the top scientist of the UNAM in Mexico, that is the most prestigious university. And then López Obrador invited her to become the director of the National Council of, of Science and Technology. So, and they went together to, they know each other since they were teenagers. So I say, okay, Ignacio, but now you have one of the two close people that you know in the Council, National Council of Science and Technology. And we have to push here to educate López Obrador. Because Lopez, Lopez Obrador was very proud that he was going to have in his, you know, in, in, in his team, this woman. So now Lopez Obrador, Ignacio Chapela told me, we have to become the opposition. No, I said, no, we have to become the proposition to create very broad uh, national fronts with community-based organizations <coughs> and to put on the table our, what we propose. And we, I, I believe that we're going to be able, I am moving to Mexico, we're starting a project in Chiapas. And, and este, but I want, please tell, tell us something more about your experience in, in all this process. How do you see it from, as a foreigner? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that, um, what, they have to 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, después para Well, sure. I mean, I think I think what Miguel says is key. That that you know, this is a process where we've got to hope that this government is going to move in the right direction. Where people, you know, for the reasons of history, you know, of, of Lopez Obrador being involved in people's movements for decades, that he's got the right instincts. But that doesn't mean that we can afford to demobilize or put down the cause. You know, it's, it's got to be pushed. Even harder, because this is a moment where there is tremendous opportunity. So, from you know across the board in Mexico, people are you know playing. It, it, it is you know what I see in part of my, part of my you know experience in Mexico has been that people are very very skeptical because they've been knocked down so many times. Their hopes have been raised and and they have, they have not been carried through. So this is a this is one of those moments where um, you know it's not suspension of disbelief. Um, you know, we're not going to become like you know Trump fanatic followers of, of anything. You know that that's a, that's a un, unacceptable to put aside our criteria. But I think this guy deserves a shot, and and that Mexico is clearly you know uniquely behind this guy, unlike any president that's ever been a, a president of Mexico in my lifetime. I think you know it's a, I think we need to support with our eyes open. And that's it. Yeah. Okay, we start the questions and answers. Yes. yes. I'm very excited about this. I feel concerned uh, for the popular support and the structure just below on low. Um, It seems as though he already has CIA target sites on him. And if he were if he were assassinated, I'm not hoping that won't happen, but if he were, are there enough people who have his vision to keep the movement going? Where well, is <laughs> that very sad? <laughs> it's, it's a really a kind of a good question because um, porque es, es, si es un líder moral muy importante he's a very important moral leader es, la aceptación el, la cantidad de votos que tuvo es increíble ha superado no sé es, cualquier votación 53%. The number of votes that he has is, is, is astounding. It's, it's more than any other president has had 53% of the total national vote. Y esta esperanza, esta esperanza que hay entre los mexicanos es muy cierta. And this, this hope among Mexicans is very real. Sí. El primero de julio salimos a la calle, eran las 3 de la mañana y la gente estábamos muy felices. On, on the 1st of July, election day, we came out the, into the streets till 3 in the morning, very happy. La posibilidad de que lo asesinen existe. The possibility that they can kill him exists. Porque estamos, eh, y yo creo que esto depende hacia donde jalemos la población, la organización. And, and this, I feel this has to do with where we push things, where the population moves the struggle. El, el primero de julio nos dijo en el Zócalo lleno, no se vayan, sigan de apoyo. On, on the 1st of July, he said in the Mexico City Zócalo, um, uh, don't leave, keep supporting you. Y lo que él dice siempre es que lo protege la gente. And he always says, the people are protecting y realmente donde él va, eh, la gente es lo otro. And, and in truth, where he goes, people protect him. Que lo puedan asesinar. So he's somebody who, who travels in commercial planes, you know, he's taking pictures with everyone, but I think he's so charismatic and everyone loves him, you know, that, well, the possibility of killing López Obrador is, 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 is uh, the possibility of the total chaos in Mexico. You know, and, and no one is, 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 is not good for anyone, for rich people, for, for, for no one. 
So that would be something crazy. Maxime, do you have a question? Yeah, it's sort of like a, an, an addendum to his question. And mine is, uh, you know, along with this incredible opportunity, he's got to be receiving a ton of pressure from the global interests, from the multinationals, from the cartel people, from all these folks. So my question is, what can we all do to support and protect him and help inoculate against that kind of pressure? Because we know everywhere in politics around the world, a good guy or a woman gets into office, and then what happens, right? So any thoughts on that that we can help support from here, from there? Anyway. Go for it. First of all, we have to engage right here in the United States and change the frickin' politics in this country because unless and until we do that, Mexico doesn't have a, the possibility of having a dignified partner. Mexico needs the United States. Like it or not like it, it's it's a relationship that is extremely, you know, indelibly important. The number of Mexicans who live in the United States, that's just where it starts. Um, you know, it, the, the, the relationship is so important. So we've got to do the work up here to cleanse the, the, the system here and to put the kind of politics that we want to have happen out there. That said, there's a lot more that can happen. I think particularly in the border regions, you know, people are, are coming together in new ways and that's across the border. The part of Mexico that's most devastated by the drug war is the border because that's where the drugs come into the United States. That's where criminal operations that's where human trafficking, that's where it's all going on. In the next few months, we, when I say we in Global Exchange, is going to be organizing some new delegations. We've done delegations to Mexico, to Chiapas, to you know, many places over the years in a kind of you know, reality tour sort of uh, you know, format. But this year we're going to be doing more of them, so keep it out because we would love to have people who are highly conscious and understand the issues of particularly around the, the, the you know, the, um, ecological issues, the kind of issues that are being discussed here, we would like those people to travel with us. We have limited our tours in recent years because of a lot of fears about um, violence and where you can go, and, but we've got new support and new you know, people working with us there because of this change. And there's a lot of interest in having people understand in greater depth what's going on so that they can become the kind of allies up here. And you know, for, for example, just to say one tiny more thing, in, in Texas, you know, there's a, there's a very prominent political race going on now, a guy named Beto O'Rourke running against Ted Cruz. It's kind of an insurgent campaign. That guy understands what's going on in Mexico. He's been part of these movements. He's gone down to Ciudad Juarez, which was his neighbor city, and, and you know, worked with the, the movements there. This is a guy who understands. So if we can get those kind of people you know, elected and in, in the United States, then we're gonna have a shot at it. If we can elect somebody like Kevin De Leon to be governor of California, that's the way that we can go. And I'm not, I'm not here to make endorsements. You know, I work for a 501c3 organization, but that's exactly what we have to do, is get the right people in the office in the United States that's more important than anything else. There's yeah, something that quickly I want to say is that one of the ideas López Obrador to stop the migration to the U.S. is that after general affairs, he's going to create a linea franca, like a, a, a free zone between, he's going to push the checkpoints in Mexico after the border, 30 kilometers inside, and in this frame, in this strip, he's going to increase the minimum wage more than the double, and he's going to lower the price of gasoline. He's going to get rid of some taxes to create more productivity, more jobs, and more well-paid jobs. And he said that's our goal to stop immigration. And in and, and, and general, if we start this, but he has so many projects like that that we have to. Is the check later. We have two questions from Theo and somebody else. Okay, can you go first? Yeah. Please? Um, with regard to Mexico's sovereignty, um, this new agroecology is almost going to be, in a sense, like a, a form of ecotourism for the rest of the world to come and you know see. Um, how do we make sure that um, the citizens of Mexico are the ones that are directly benefiting from it rather than, you know, because we have folks that are immigrating there illegally. I'm going to Mexico, I'm going to Japan, Georgia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, well, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, the I think that there is enough infrastructure. Ronnie is, is in Chiapas, and I'm going to Chiapas, we got 50 acres, and we're going to create an, a coalition. We can talk if you're interested later about it, and we're going to work with Global Exchange to have some. Okay. 
and we, I want to lead them. Just kidding. Este, Teo. Yeah, and you're going to work with um, Rene and... Rene is going to be the manager of the farm okay. with Miguel Arquiel. <laughs> okay. 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 So I want to just pick up on another uh, observation. There's a, there's a movement in California. We have 53 Congress people. Like there are only six or seven who are supporting some of the most critical legislations. And so anybody that has any relationship, cousins, brothers, I don't care, uh, certainly sisters, where you can like rent a house or take part of a house or take over a, a YMCA or whatever. And basically the last two weeks of the month, or, or, of the time, right before uh, the election, it's just walk door to door, walk door to door. Kari Hammerschlag, who maybe many of you know because she's a major mover in all of the farm bills. She works for Friends of Europe as their um, agricultural senior scientist. And she's running a house in an area in Tulare where within 40 miles there are two congressional seats. So my partner and I are going, and I think everybody should just get down in the areas where there are flippable uh, congressional seats because just the way that you said, if we end up with having the right people in Washington, it's going to make a really big difference. My concern about what you said, so that's that's my political push. Um, my concern is that this, this guy, very skeptical, he sounds Carl Rokish, Alfonso Romo. Yeah, and I, I just, I just, what, I mean, here he is, he's had this history, he has this power. He's a citizen, I think so, because I don't care how, how you know, stubborn he is or, you know, how, how much pressure he's going to be put, putting on the current president. Um, I'm just really concerned. I want to see, other than him traveling on commercial airlines and people protecting him, I just want to know what kind of legal or other um, uh, activities, what, what kind of shield? Does he have, or how is he going to be addressed and respected, this Mr. Romo, so that he understands that there's a role that he can play, and it's not the one that he's done here to do. I think the most important thing is organizing. The most important thing is the organizing. Organizing, and especially in these temas crucial things. Alimentation, agriculture. Otro de los temas, otro de los temas en, en debate y donde el ministro es, eh, es un representante de los poderes económicos es la educación. Um, and the, in, in other areas, uh, what is the ministro? De educación. The, and in particular with the minister of education. Entonces, creo que tenemos que entender que nos tenemos que organizar, que esto es La, la lucha sigue y que tenemos que organizarnos, tanto aquí en Estados Unidos como en México, y que puede ser una muy buena experiencia si realmente logramos desde abajo transformar el país. So we need to keep organizing here in the United States, in Mexico, to really have the, the uh, to create the transformation of the country. Both countries. <laughs> well, oh, oh, todo el mundo. <laughs> well, what, what we have to really educate other people, our co-workers, family members, friends, is about the the integration that there is an integration in fact between California and so so the, for the, the, the southern states and the in Mexico. Well actually the whole country, you know. In in the US we have sixty million Latinos. We're the largest min, min, minority. And, and if you think of New York, for example, all from four new, newborn children, two are Latinos, and one is from Mexican parents, and the other one from Dominican Republic. So 25% of the, of the kids that are in 25 years, 25% of 20 years old are going to be Mex from Mexican parents in New York. But if you go to Los Angeles, you know, to, to Colorado, places like that. So we, we have to educate and talk to each other about this integration that is happening. And it's in this topic, you know, nothing is going to stop it. So I want to, I'm sorry, you have, you have the last question. 
Hugo Chavez, a Maduro, a, 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 a este poder es muy rico, ¿verdad? ¿Y cómo es el ejército de México en, en, um, en vez de, de um, so, apoyar a, 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 a López Obrador? Yo, what I think is yes. that Hugo Chávez, Evo Morales, they are coming from a, the same generation, maybe of López Obrador, but they experienced earlier all these attacks. So López Obrador got now the, the experience of all these different governments, and he's not trying not to, to, evade, to, to, to prevent the same confrontation that they experienced with the international interests. You know, so, so that is very important, you know. When you are a politician, you have to really, really have very good advisors and where not to go. And well, they, 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 there is in Mexico, the, the, you know, the history of you know, what's, what is going to happen is going to be very different. They're not in the, it's not the same situation. The, the structure of the country, the military, a lot of elements are really different. It's, there's a lot to go into to really, you know, um, uh, suss that out, but I don't think we're going to uh, see the situa a parallel situation. It could be very <coughs> confrontational, things could happen, but it's not going to go along the same lines as those South Americans. Uh, pero yo quiero decir algo. Yo creo que no, pode no podemos decir que no hay para bien. Por supuesto, es una no, historia. Sí, sí. Es una historia que está vigente. En el sentido de... No, 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 pero traduce. Oh, okay. So that's what she said. I'm sorry, I was getting into a conversation. She's saying, you know, uh, as opposed to what I was just saying, that we have to look at the parallel, that there is a parallel, it's a his, there is a history. Uno de los grandes problemas de Venezuela es la alimentación. One of the great problems in Venezuela is food. Es la alimentación. El gran capital de Venezuela, una sola empresa en Venezuela controla la comida. One big company in Venezuela controls the food. capital venezolano. Entonces, aprendamos de esas lecciones y no seamos optimistas. No. Okay. So, Pero, we've learned from these lessons and it doesn't make us optimistic. Excuse me, we forgot that. But we are positive. <laughs> but we are positive and proactive and we're going to keep pushing. Okay? Push we're positive and proactive and we're going to keep pushing. Thank you so much. We have here Marta Benavides from the Colorado Request. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. Oh, so, okay. And what, what Okay, she, she want to connect the discussion with Mexico and Central America. Okay. We're going to go, Adelita, vente para acá, Adelita. I'm going to move. No, because she want to continue the discussion about El Salvador, Central America and Mexico. So we can come in and get it. But before she's going to... I'm going to talk for 20 minutes or 15 minutes about it, and then we can open the discussion with the other. You can thank you so much for being here.
And we have to pay attention to the fullness of things because if they don't get us one way, they get us another way, you know? And people don't know. But at this moment, I am trying to raise to you the problem of oceans because they are, the oceans are the ones that are maintaining the balance of climate. And if we are not careful, we can be discussing everything and do it having Lopez Obrador and all that. And, you know, something is going to happen and happen in Puerto Rico. You know, the hurricanes came and destroyed everything and they are still not having, they have been able to rebuild. And there is at least uh, 130,000 families in Puerto Rico that don't have electricity and that creates a big problem. It's conditions, you know, where nations are so dependent on fuel energy. So I'm just trying to highlight that. But then, you know, I had some friends here and they kept saying, you have to come, you have to come. And so they arranged it and that's why I'm here. Late, but here. Um, we don't use the word activism in my country. Really, you know, to be called an activist in El Salvador for people who are politically involved is an insult. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, and then people tell me, well, what are you if you're not an activist? We, we know that we are militants. You know, that we have been, we don't jump from one thing to the other. We go transforming it, but it is about changing the system that we have because it's the system that we have that is demanding all this activism. And so we have to have clarity that really, if there is a structural problem that is defining everything and creating the problems that we have. So, let's say, we are very happy that something happened like that in, in Mexico, you know. But I was in exile in Mexico when people were very fed up with the pre, remember? <laughs> yes, I know. And not that I am defending the pre. And all the things that people were saying about the pre, it was correct. The problem is that I was seeing that things were happening, you know, where uh, foreign powers and the Catholic Church and some of the big enterprise there got together and they were pushing for fun. You know, and I said, look, pay attention because you are angry and you have to get rid of print, but have we built what we need that is strong enough, you know, to be able to carry. And for us in El Salvador and Central America, Mexico is very key. And to tell you the truth, the way I see it, Mexico has been key throughout history, you know, uh, since Columbus got lost. <laughs> yes. And you know, uh, and Mexico had to uh, take a, a role that is very important for all of the continent and really around the world. With all the corruption that happened in Mexico, but a lot of the conventions that we have that can be useful to us right now to defend human rights, economic, social, and cultural rights of people, you know, the right to development, the right to peace, and all that, Mexico was very involved and really pushing for that with other countries in Latin America, specifically Cuba. And, uh, and then, you know, with other countries. It was uh, because of all that work that, uh, you know, we had the, uh, the Commission on Decolonization. And so because we, there were many countries the last century that still were not independent. And that created a big imbalance because in the realm of things, you know, uh, uh, they would vote with uh, the powers that were still in the colonial power. And so uh, many countries, and I'm just you know, trying to get you to see the larger picture that we have to see all the time, because uh, it was in the middle of last century, most of the countries that were still under colonial powers were finally uh, getting their formal independence. And that doesn't mean, you know, like you can be independent formally. And you're going to celebrate the 16th of September. It's Independence Day in Mexico, right? In, our, in Central America, it's the 15th of September. But yours was many years before ours. And the thing is that, you know, if we don't get those things in order and we don't work together, then we can have an OAS that is promoting right now invasion in some of the countries that is going to affect what's happening in Mexico and is affecting what's happening in the whole continent and the Caribbean. So all this creates you know, a, 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 a world situation that you know, is defining what's happening with climate. It's defining you know, 
where, who, where the money goes. It's defining what you, uh, the universities are teaching, because at this point, instead of going to the urgent things that have to be taken care of, such as life on the planet, you know, and the care of the quality of life, well, you know, you, the, the young people are going to school to get a degree so that they can get a good salary and get more money, but then a lot of the people are not getting a job. So, we know in my country that, you know, we cannot be activists, that we have to be committedly working, and even when you win, you know, it can go wrong. Like, you know, we have a big problem right now in our country because many of the people that were in the liberation process are not working that path right now. And the problem is that we can get angry with them, and then we can punish them, and it goes against you. Because the people that are very conservative, they continue to vote for them. While the ones that can understand and have any discernment, they say, we are not going to vote for the friendly because they are doing this and this. And I'm not defending the friend. I'm defending us to be able to tell the friend what to do. But if we vote against ourselves, and then we have a legislature where now the conservatives have the power, every little thing that is not revolutionary, but it has been revolutionary in a country such as mine, like making sure that the kids have shoes to go to school. You know, all those kids that never had the uniform, they couldn't go to school because they didn't have uh, papers and pencils and things like that, or the schools were not good, or, you know, they couldn't go because they couldn't eat. Those kinds of things have been resolved, kind of, not at the level that we need to, but those are the very things that then this conservative legislature, you don't even have to have a Trump guy, you know? They, they can get against every, everything like that and obstruct it and go backwards. And so we have to be very careful. So at the same time that we have to force a movement that can help to get people at the levels that we need, we have to know that they are our staff. Lopez Obrador is their staff. So, uh, I am just giving you a glimpse about these things, but I'm saying that it's possible. Mm -hmm. We can be the different, but we must choose to be the different, not in an activist way, but in a very committed you know, way so that we understand that we have the power that to make the difference. And I think yeah. it was you, There's one in the middle of the floor over here.
also would like to comment one of the, one of the things that I heard you asking was what is the foundation that's being built that we can turn to. And I think that because we have a tendency to act out of urgency, um, when there's so much that's urgent everywhere, we're overwhelmed. And we don't necessarily know, oh my gosh, what can I do? Many people are despairing. And they've lost their hope already and their kind of will to do anything. So what is the foundation that will unite us, like those three sisters, that will bring us spiritually into one, into one, here in the U.S., with Mexico, with El Salvador, with, you know, the people from around the world? What are these bases that can unify us? I was up in uh, Washington State for Protecting Mother Earth earlier this summer, and uh, our our relatives from the Brazilian Amazon, from the rainforest, have been working with their allies around the world, and they have developed 17 principles for alliance, the alliance of Mother Earth's guardians and allies. These principles are something that I guarantee everyone in here will agree with every one of them. You can join this alliance, sign your name, and utilize it and bring it to our governments bring it to people and say we must abide by these. Among these principles are that we look to our indigenous relatives who have been stewarding this mother earth and the waters and the sky and um, and and um, they've been stu yes I just need to say this because I think it's it ties some things together here that that um, that when when there that we create these laws so that when a mining company goes anywhere and wants a permit to extract whatever it is, drill water, crack, anything, um, out of this earth, that we go and we get three prior informed consent from the people in that region who rely on those re resources or let's say sources of life. Can we agree on that? that we can create laws that way and that can help direct our action. So I just wanted to say that much because I think everything that you have all brought is so... And they were angry and they were demanding. And we told them, hmm, make me do it. Yeah. Now people think, oh, I don't care, you know, how he reacted, make me do it. He is his right. He meant, you want those things, work for them. Make sure that those people that you put as an elected official, do it. Educate them. Tell them how to do it. And so, for example, in El Salvador, part of the so-called activism that you call around here is that we have movements. We have big movements. You know, tiny little country. The first thing that, for the first time in the history of the world, we want, you know, a case against the mining company. They have to pay. You know, and right now they're trying to figure out how not to pay. And you know, they find all kinds of ways. So, because they lost, they have a fine to be paid. Now, you know, they only have to pay us, according to the court, $7 million because of the expenses that we made taking them to court. But they were saying that if we lost, we had to pay them $340 million. Uh huh. And what? Oh, because you know, we had an investment that we had. We were thinking how much we were going to make, and that's how the courts work. So we had to educate people, and many people were murdered in our country. And even we had to get the Catholic Church, and sometimes we are very much against to join for <laughs> And we won. So they had to leave. You think that they left? They formed a foundation. And they put a nice name to it, you know? And so they are creating little centers for the little kids, you know, and then the moms can feel good, you know. The, the little kids go and learn this or the other, and a playground, you know. And if, if people are not clear, you know, it takes you for a ride. So they haven't paid, they don't want to leave, they are waiting for the, the new, um, uh, the election for president is coming next year. They are waiting for us to lose so that they can start again the mess, you know. Go backwards.
take it back to court. They even changed from the company that uh, had made the deal into another one with a U.S. company that wasn't having anything to do with it. But you know, the way that they merge these things, if you're not careful, you lose. So already we are organizing at the Central American level. Because already, for example, in, in Guatemala, there are 40 permits to go and do exploration in the beaches of Guatemala. You see the beaches? Yeah, they want to be doing this thing, you know? And they come and they destroy. It's destroying the beaches is really very harmful. This is, you know, affecting the whole uh, life in the planet because if there is only one planet and there is the oceans and all that, you know? So we are organizing with the people's movements in Guatemala, you know, about this. But then the Filipinos found out that we won, you know, and then Filipinos came to see what we were doing. And we got to know these things. And one of the things I'm coming to tell you is that as much as you have a lot of uh, information with all this social media, you don't know these things. And then in your own time, in your own face, they're doing all these tools, but it's going to affect all of you. Because they set it up there, so that they bring it here, or they bring it here, and then they get there. You know, what's happening in Puerto Rico is how they want to do it all over the world. After the hurricane, they started immediately to privatize everything. Like I said, the same thing happened in Katrina. So that's why we cannot be activists. We have to really be committedly involved. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the this is the time of our life. This is the project. The project is to be free and to be able to have quality of life. Not even for us at this point. We have to think of the great grandchildren of your great grandchildren. Yeah. This is the work that we're doing, and for that. This uh, conference has been very good, you know. They have brought all kinds of people. And I'm very sorry sitting there and saying, we cannot do this in my country because they harass us, they are calling us terrorists because we are fighting against the privatization of water. We were able to get the National University, all the students and the provost to march, you know, and join all the peasant and the, the impoverished people and went to the uh, legislature with the position, you know, that we are against the privatization of water, that this is a human, a human right, and it is a universal human right, and we want our country not only to put it in our constitution, but also take it to the UN so everybody should have, you know, that right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they get up, they get up, they propose. At the end of so the legislature, and then suddenly you used to have pictures of the provost with something on his head because he went with us. And then the legislature said, we are going to take you to court because you are doing terrorist actions. This is what we have to know because, you know, what goes around goes around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are foreign governments there that are very supportive of them. The special rapporteur of the United Nations on human rights, because of all the violations that are coming, because of the violence, women have been murdered because they are women. Many, you know, and so we had to fight with the Supreme Court, make laws about this. So you have to become, a, you know, you have to know about everything. And we have to educate the people and we have to discuss it and all that. And the young people have been killed. I know we have the guns, but the guns are not our problem. They are a problem, but they are not our problem. They are like that because they have not received the kind of support that they need as young people to develop as they should. Mm -hmm. So that's our problem, you know, to take care of them, but not see them that because they are there, uh, they are the cause of the problems. It's organized crime that is our problem. So we have to deal with that too. And trafficking and the migration, you know, all of that. We cannot afford not to get involved. So, you know, like we cannot work right now with this whole issue of the privatization of water. We have united all the movements and every day with actions all over the country to stop it and, and to denounce it and to take it to court. You know, anything that can help us to stop that. And 
So the, the thing that, that I am trying to tell you is that for a long time I have seen that Latin America has disappeared from the picture in the United States, from the picture. It used to be during the war in my country that uh, there was a lot of education in the United States about the causes of the war and how to stop it. And people responded well. But you know, it took people constantly educating and uniting people from my country and Latin America and people in this country. And then something happened and we went down. The first major march, big march in the United States since the Vietnam War was the war to stop the war, the, the march to stop the war in Salvador. And we had to really, I, I don't want to be marching all the time, you know. I want to have vacation and not every weekend be marching against this and against the other. So we have to figure out how do we create that. And there are ways. You are seeing this in, you know, in those programs that we have here. But all of a sudden, you know, there is an analysis that Latin America is a middle income, you know, continent. So, uh, renta, me renta media, we call it, you know. And so they say, well, you don't need help. It's not, we never needed any help. We needed them to stop us, you know, stop uh, creating the problems for us. If they didn't make all the problems for us, we wouldn't need any help. So <laughs> stop helping us by not creating problems for us. And we think, do justice in your country. We'd be very happy to see everybody happy here. We see what's happening with other people. We see that your people don't have jobs. Every, the education system is a, a, a big problem. Health problem. So take care of the people of this country. But not at the expense of any nation. And this is, we need you to know that. So the problem is that for the longest time, there was a relationship between the people, people of the US and the people of our countries in Latin America. And you knew what was happening. So for example, the situation that happened in Brazil. I'm not defending Dilma. I know her. I am not defending Lula. What happened is that all those people that wanted to use the issue of corruption that was not proven even, you know, they didn't want to correct the corruption. They want to be able to corrupt it better. Because the first thing that that new president in Brazil did is, as soon as he got in there, pass a law with a very conservative Congress, you know, and Senate, so that uh, for 20 years there won't be any social investment. And Macri has done the same thing in Argentina. You see, and, and then people say, oh, well, because that, that you have all that corruption. Huh? Don't tell me. You know, like in our country, we would say when people in this country talk about our corruption, yeah, look at the donkey talking about the big ears. <laughs> so we need to get together. And for this issue of climate, we must create the climate of unity. I like how she finished her, her story, you know, about how the corn and the squash and the beans together make the qualitative difference to have a nutrition in a country. We have to work like that. And we need people from this country to go back to that idea of keeping track of what, what are the policies of your country doing in our countries. How come your vice president is all the time around there, you know? Why are they promoting? So I was supposed to be an activist again before you, you know? But I said, I better come and tell you to do because I don't think I'm coming back too much around here because I am not in the United States, I live in my country. And what I have said to you, uh, you know, most people don't even, they don't hear it. They, they tell me, we don't know what's happening.